Last month we were looking at Drupal 8 a bunch. Uh, Pantheon now has official Drupal 8 support, so uh, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and as I go through the demo, if you have any questions that, that come up, uh, just feel free to, to raise your hand or, or shout them out. Uh, and if there's any areas in particular that you want me to cover, uh, we, can, we can add that to the agenda. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm Steve Kirsch. You can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, Drupal.org, just about everywhere at, at Steve Vector. So what's a Pantheon? Uh, well, we're a, a company based in San Francisco, California. Uh, right, right there in those offices. Uh, so Pantheon was started by four guys who had lots of experience building Drupal sites for clients. Uh, guys from the, the Four Kitchens Agency, Chapter 3, they had been uh, solving the same hosting problems over and over again for their clients. And, and this is something that I think just about any agency building lots of websites for lots of different clients is, is going to run into where you've got one site hosted uh, internally at a large enterprise organization and they have their own VPNs and hoops you have to jump through to, to get uh, access to that site. One project is hosted on Bluehost or some shared host and it, it can be a pain to keep track of. You've got to keep track of a bunch of different credentials you need to keep track of what is the slightly different deployment workflow. And um, you know, it, it looks something like this, where you may have some sites on shared hosting, where a bunch of websites are all crammed on to the same server. Uh, <coughs> your, your five, ten dollar a month hosting setup, where a bunch of sites are all in one place. And if one of them ha has a big traffic spike, then it, it has a chance to bring down the whole server. Uh, for a while, I was, I was trying to put sites that I was building on, onto virtual machines. There are a bunch of places where, where you can go and slide a slider up and down every $5 and get a little bit more RAM, a little bit more storage. And, and that works for plenty of Drupal use cases. And then maybe on a, on a higher end site, you've got to set up a load balancer. You need to set up app servers, database servers, and that's great, you can scale in, in that fashion, but it's, it's time consuming. And even for complex websites, the client isn't going to feel great about paying the top developer for a whole month to set up uh, a complex hosting infrastructure. And it, it gets hard to keep track of when your, your agency has dozens, hundreds of websites to keep track of, each in that slightly different variation of shared hosting, virtual machines, a custom cluster. Uh, it's, it's overwhelming, at least I always found it overwhelming to, to keep track of all the passwords, all the different deployment workflows. So at Pantheon, we standardize the, the tooling and the, the conceptual models that the developers has, have to keep track of, regardless of the size of the website. So if it's uh, on the small end at our $25 a month, plan, uh, you've got one app server, you've got your database server, you can still think of it as one contained chunk, uh, one set of, of services that are talking to one another. If you scale up a little bit more and you've got two application servers necessary, you've got a lot of caching needs, so Redis is involved, that's fine. The, the way the services interrelate is the same whether or not you're at that low end where you're scaling up. Even if you're scaling up to you know dozens of, of app servers, if you're the new republic.com and you've got millions of people coming to your website every month, uh, and we're, we're scaling dozens of app servers horizontally. So the developers working on the site, they can keep the same conceptual models. And I find this really helpful for those agencies that are trying to work on multiple sites. It doesn't matter if you're jumping from a small site to a medium site to a big site. The same workflow applies. So as, as we were just talking about uh, informally, the cloud has made a whole bunch of promises that the cloud is just going to allow us to instantly provision things and you don't have to maintain the cloud because uh, that just happens automatically. Uh, but uh, as I was just saying, the cloud is just a buzzword for other people's computers. And with a lot of those, those hosting environments where you're, you're buying just a VM, well, you still have a lot of work to do to figure out how am I going to 
actually get a Drupal site hosted here? How am I going to set up my live environment? How am I going to set up my staging or, or test environment and you know, a dozen development environments? So yes, Pantheon is, is running on a cloud infrastructure and, and we like it because we're not the ones uh, maintaining the physical servers and that's nice, but there's still a ton of work that has to go into standardizing what's the software that's, that's running on on these cloud instances. And for a large portion of Drupal websites, the, the hosting setup can be exactly the same. Um, the, uh, if we can move past this idea that every site has to have a, a completely separate hosting setup, we can use the same varnish and fig for all of our sites. We can use the same load balancer setup for all of our sites, regardless of if it's a small site or, or a big site. So, uh, so Pantheon is is saying to, to agencies and, and individual developers, you don't have to be the person who's on call 24-7 if, if the site goes down. Because if a site on Pantheon goes down, we're going to know about it. If there's a problem with one site, there'll be a problem most likely with more than one site, and we'll be, a, we'll be on it right away. So uh, if you're you know, just a, a small shop trying to support a couple websites, you don't have to be the 24-7 on-call person. So uh, we, we do get some of those those cloud benefits of being able to, to instantly provision different environments. And, and I'll show that in, in a couple minutes here, this idea that if you're working professionally on, on a Drupal site or just about any size, You'll need the live site, of course. You'll also need a couple other environments. You'll need a test site uh, to test your code changes before they go live. You'll need a, a development site where, where you can be potentially editing files directly on the server, the same architecture that gets used on the live site and, and see what happens. Uh, this comes up of, of collaboration. So if, if you're a, a shop with a couple of people each editing code, there's a good chance that each person has their own branch and they don't want to be stepping on each other's toes. They don't want to have to coordinate too much uh, just in order to get their code on a URL where, where the client can see it. And again, the, the maintenance is something that I, I never wanted to worry about when, when I was just developing websites. I don't want to worry about what is the flavor of Linux at the bottom of all this. I don't want to worry about like, you know, the open SSL function. In the, in the web community, we've had some really scary bugs in the last year. And on a, on a platform like Pantheon, they can be fixed for 100,000 websites, all in the same day, all with the same amount of work. Um, and Ania is the developer of the website. I never had to worry about Heartbleed directly for, for a site goes on, on Pantheon. Uh, so security, we just talked about. Uh, smooth scaling, I was showing that slide about um, moving up and down the number of app servers you have. I'll, I'll show a little bit more on that um, in a minute. And, and one thing that I like um, as a developer putting sites on Pantheon is there's, there's a good chance that someone's a little bit further ahead of me. Uh, someone uh, may need another PHP extension. Uh, someone may need uh, Varnish, for instance. That's, those are additions that came to the platform because high volume sites needed it. And once we figure out Varnish for one set of sites, we figured it out for everybody. I was, I was surprised Pantheon didn't make a bigger deal of it. That happened, I don't know, within the last year or two. And, and me just as a, as a developer um, working on Pantheon, I didn't even know. But suddenly sites were a little bit faster because all the sites had, had Varnish available to them. So, uh, so that's the, the, the high level, and I'm going to jump into a demo. I'm going to talk about that and demo that um, dev, test, live workflow a little bit. We'll be looking at the, the dashboard that Pantheon offers for managing these environments. Uh, this concept of multi-dev, the idea that you can have even more environments than dev, test, and live if you have multiple developers needing to be working on different branches. Terminus, the command line tool that Matt and I were just talking about um, Drush integration, uh, the concept of custom upstreams uh, like Monopoly uh, or Commerce, these um, distributions or, or variations on Drupal Core. 
where you might want to be able to push updates to a bunch of different sites all at the same time. And then last but certainly not least, we'll talk a little bit about Drupal 8. Um, before I dive in, does, does anyone have any other topics that um, they want to make sure get covered? Matt. After you touch on Drupal 8, if there's anything with console, I think that'd be interesting to hear. Ooh. All right. I have not done anything Drupal console specific. But we can say that after 8 and all that. All right. All right. Well, we'll take a look. All right. So the Pantheon dashboard. All right. Uh, in the last year or so, uh, we've done a lot of improvements around this concept of organizations. We're finding that uh, most of our most of our clients have um, have this concept of an organization, be it an agency, be it one large enterprise company. So here we have Mission Bicycles, which is a real bicycle company started by some of those Pantheon founders. And we, we also use this for, for our demonstration sites. So the site we'll be looking at uh, today is, is a site called Chula Vista Choppers, but it's really just the same live Mission Bicycle site copied a bunch of times. Uh, so anyway, let's, let's look at the live version of this site. Uh, and what we'll be looking at changing between these environments is the background color. Uh, in, in the last one, I've, I've learned more of the names that are available for CSS background colors. Not a very exciting thing in that way that we're here to talk about, but, uh, but I didn't know that Burleywood was a valid CSS color, and I think that's interesting. So I'm getting way ahead of myself talking about CSS colors. Let's talk about this dashboard. So first of all, uh, organizations. We've got uh, all the sites owned by the organization. We've got uh, a way of, of filtering a bit. We can see what service levels are, are used by these sites. Um, some of our sites are at the sandbox level, some at the professional level. Uh, and we, we can filter by what upstreams are in use. Some upstreams are this custom upstream of Mission Bicycles. Uh, some are uh, vanilla Drupal 7. We can see that there are a bunch of people affiliated with this organization, uh, mostly just Pantheon employees. And uh, we've got one custom upstream, the, the Mission Bicycles upstream. So let's, let's look a little bit more at the dashboard for a single site. So we're just looking at the overall organization da dashboard for dealing with a group of people, a group of sites. We're now looking at one site and we're looking at the, the live area for that site. So from this dashboard, I can, I can see what team members, and the only team members in play here are me. Uh, we've, we've got the supporting organization of Mission Bicycle, so anyone affiliated with that organization could have some level of access to the site. If I wanted, if I wanted to add David or Matt to just this site, I could do that as well here. Uh, settings specific to this site. We can we can move the plan up and down. And I'm I'll move this plan up to a professional plan. And uh, that that'll change um, a couple things. We'll see add-ons like um, solar, Redis, these are available uh, they're available two sandboxes. If you just want to try out Pantheon for free, try out our Solar and Redis integration, you can do that. Uh, if you want to take a site live and use something like Solar or Redis, you can do so at the professional plan and above. Uh, I could delete this site, but I, I don't want to do that right now. Some basic information about the site, PHP version. Uh, yes, we do still use PHP 5.3, even though to the wider PHP world that is officially unsupported. We found that the, the potential um, risk isn't, isn't all that great for, um, for our use case. You, you can jump up to PHP 5.5 as well. If you start a WordPress project on Pantheon, it'll default to 5.5. But a lot of the Drupal community, um, or I should say, enough Drupal code 
still needs 5.3 and hasn't been updated to work with higher versions. Uh, let's keep going because PHP versions are one of the things that I as a developer don't want to have to worry about ever. Uh, and, and Pantheon just handles upgrading those for me. Um, so other things in this dashboard. Connection information. We, if we wanted to, we could connect directly to this database with this database information, uh, SFTP, etc. Code, um, not a whole lot of code changes have happened on the site. I spun it up just today. As you can see, I've been changing background colors, uh, status. I think I'll get a fuller status report under the dev site because I just ran this uh, beforehand. So Pantheon maintains an open source project on Drupal.org called uh, Site Audit, and it gives me basic information about the site. Am I following best practices? Uh, is there anything suspicious with my cache settings? When has cron run? Uh, well, we will see some warnings here. I've got some out-of-date modules. Uh, that may be it as far as warnings. Well, and it tells me that there have been a couple PHP notices and warnings. So nothing too crazy. Uh, and again, this is this is a tool that, that you can run even without Pantheon. Um, a couple of months ago, I was running this on, on a site that, that wasn't getting launched on, on Pantheon. And it's, it's just a handy tool that you can run with Drush alone. So uh, workflow, here's, here's where it gets interesting. So, we have the option of cloning down database and files from one environment to another environment. So uh, this, is, this is something that you'd be doing quite a lot as a developer, bringing down files in the database from the live environment to the dev environment. The, um, the, the basic best practice in the Drupal community is to move the database and files down from the live environment to your test environment, to your dev environment, to any local environments you have. So the database and files are moving down from the canonical site, code changes are moving up. And uh, as we'll get to in, in Drupal 8, there's much better handling now in core for moving configuration changes up as well. Um, so it can take a little while. Uh, and while all that completes, we'll keep going. So uh, no PHP errors to report, great. Uh, if we needed to add custom domains, we could. Uh, some of our, some of the people using Pantheon like to add even custom dev domains. If you want to have dev.example.com, you can do that. Uh, but otherwise, we just get um, a Pantheon.io domain. So, there we go. This is the burly web. Yes, all right. This CSS color is called burly web. I forget what this one is called. Uh, anyway, backups. Everyone likes backups. So, it's very simple to like, create a backup and uh, get your code, your database, your files backed up to Amazon S3. We'll keep them just about as, as long as you could ever need. Uh, security. It's pretty simple to turn HTTP authentication on and off. This is the sort of thing that isn't, isn't all that hard, but it, it can be painful to keep track of if you're working on um, a hundred sites across your agency, uh, because because there are a bunch of different ways to do HTTP authentication, uh, it's easy to forget which one uh, which one is in use. So we should get this now. Test. All right, I think I got past. The, uh, the HTTP authentication. There we go. So um, I'll, I'll turn that back off. Not a big deal. Just uh, something that's nice to have standardized because uh, 
Otherwise, I find a development team will, will argue about simple things like that uh, disproportionate to the, the value. What I like, one of the things I like about Pantheon is that it standardizes things for which there are many acceptable answers. You can do that HTTP authentication at the Apache level. You can do it in settings.php. There's almost certainly a module for it. Um, but if you're on Pantheon, you can just use this. Same thing with the Git branching strategies. There are so many different philosophies on how you do Git <coughs> branching. And you can argue about it all day. And I, I have argued about it all day sometimes. But it, you, did, you may not get to an, a place that is actually better after arguing about it all day. So with, with Pantheon, what the branching strategy that you're encouraged to use is master is your master branch. Anytime you push changes to master, they're going to end up on the dev site. And that's something we can take a look at uh, in a little bit here. So you're pushing to dev on the master branch. Anytime you want to pull code from dev into test, we've got a UI for that. Um, So this is a, a UI that's bringing over a code change from dev to test. And what's happening under the hood is Git is making a tag. So that's the best practice anywhere you're hosting. Make Git tags when you want to deploy code to your test environment or, your, or to your live environment. There should be a tag that says, this is what the test environment was, or this is what the live environment was starting on, on this day at this time. Um, so what we're doing here is basically uh, a UI on top of git tag dash a, yeah, dash a for annotate um, And then uh, if, if you do want to get a little fancier and do your own tagging or branching strategy, I did just put up a blog post yesterday about uh, hot fix workflows. If for whatever reason you want to circumvent the, the process that is encouraged by our dashboard, you can make your own tags, push them directly to Pantheon, and deployments will get triggered. Uh, but that's, that's more of an ad advanced use case and um, shouldn't be necessary in normal usage. So we've, we've now pushed uh, deployed from dev to test. And, uh, and we can go to the test environment and we'll get the same background color that, that had been on the dev environment. Uh, up next, we'll take a look at multi-dev. So we... Question. Yeah? Um, your, your classification of a hotfix, you say that you have to do a workaround. To me, a hotfix is just a just a special release, I mean, you, you so, have a branch. If you. So, at least according to Wikipedia. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Hot, I, I think so. <laughs> hot fix simply means you're circumventing your normal process. So, in, in yeah, to it some is. degree. It is. Yeah. So, if, if your normal process is, you've got the master branch, you're tagging master, that tag then goes from uh, the dev environment to the test environment to the live environment. If that's normal, then circumventing that at all makes it a hotfix. So the the way someone would normally hotfix on Pantheon is let let's say the last time you deployed to live was a month ago, and since then a ton of other changes have gone into master, mm -hmm. and they're fine changes, but they're not quite ready to go live. And then you get a ticket saying the background color must be changed to burly wood right now. <laughs> then what you can do is branch off of what's presently on live, change that one CSS line, tag, and then push your tag. So you don't push that back into dev? You create a separate branch for that? I, I would say, after, well, you would merge it back into master once it's done and live reason you shouldn't do it in the other order is because you 
in this in this hypothetical scenario, you don't want master going live yet because it contains a bunch of changes. That so make it so you create a hotfix branch in order to just deal with the one issue and roll up the release and get it out. Yeah, and then merge the hotfix change and into the master. The master and then yeah. the next release will be part. You just yeah. talked about that today. Yeah. Right. Okay. So they should talk about that more because that was one thing that always got me is the lack of hot fixability. Yes. So that should be highlighted a lot. Well, it's at the top of the blog right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and we, we know that um, it's something that we could highlight in the dashboard as well. Like Acquia's dashboard, you just you just select what tag you want on, and we're, what we need to balance is still encouraging what we think is a, a valid best practice of tag off of master mm -hmm. and go from there, while making it easier to circumvent that when necessary. Um, I think there's there's a risk that if we, we just make options for everything, then, then it becomes easier to, to shoot yourself in the foot and it becomes easier to lose an entire afternoon to arguing about branching and tagging strategies when it really doesn't matter that much. Mm -hmm. So every, every, every hotfix has its own branch? Well, every deployment has its own tag. That's the part that matters. But in, in, a, in the sense of a hotfix, the tag is a branch. You don't. Mm. You don't need the branch. Like yeah, you could. Yeah. You could create the branch to do your whatever stuff. Tag it and then delete the branch. Oh yeah, but but it's still okay. You can delete the branch, but you have to. Okay. I mean, once you've tagged the thing, that's pointing at a specific revision. Right. Right. Well, yeah, I suppose you could delete the branch after you push it back into master, or otherwise you're sort of screwed. Right? Oh, you could delete it after you deploy it. Right. Yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think as soon as any branch, hotfix or not, I think as soon as it's merged into master, delete the branch. Otherwise, we'll just have a lot of historical branches. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, figure it out. Well, I, most people don't write code that requires a kind of approach, do they? I mean, in, in, in Git, you kind of create a branch for everything, right? Like, someone makes, like, a new feature, so they make a branch that only exists until it gets merged, and then you'll end up with, like, 500 branches, so why not just delete them afterwards? I don't know. Everyone had This is a thing we could argue about. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's, let's take a look at the concept of multi-dev. So we've looked at a dev test live. Does anyone have questions just about that that flow of going from dev to test to live. All right, let's talk about... I have a compliment. That encouraged me to use a work... I was aware of that workflow before. Mm -hmm. and when I started doing sites on Pantheon, you made me do it. And that <laughs> was a very good thing. Well, good. Yeah, I, I found it painful to set up that that flow like on a, on a totally vanilla VM. It's like, great, I've got Ubuntu, now I need to set up vhosts and just a bunch of things that I don't feel like doing. Um, when all I want to do is like write my Drupal code, I don't want to be worrying. I don't even want to think about the word vhost. So no. uh, and, and this is a, a good way of, of abstracting that out. So, so here I've got a multi-dev environment. So a multi-dev environment is simply an additional development environment that corresponds to a branch. So I've got a, a git branch called css-mint, and that's the branch that's running on this environment. Dev runs the master branch. This new environment runs the branch css-mint. And uh, good time as any to, to look at SFTP. So I, I am in SFTP mode. You can either be in Git mode where you're doing all your changes locally and pushing them up, or you can be in SFTP mode where you can open up transmit or connect your IDE. Yesterday I was connecting PHP Storm for the first time to Pantheon. Um, th this is how I developed years ago in, in Dreamweaver, connecting Dreamweaver to 
to FF to FTP. The first version control system I ever used was Dreamweaver lock files, which I don't recommend. Uh, it's like, if everyone on your team is using Dreamweaver, then you can use these small files to indicate Steve has styles.css and no one else should touch it. But that's not a good way of working. Uh, and it seems like the internet is, is anyone else having internet troubles? All right, there we go. So, I, maybe I jumped a little bit too fast there. So what we're looking at here is the, the root for this Pantheon environment. We have our files directory, which sim links to you know, Drupal's sites, default files, or WordPress and <coughs> some uploaded files location. Um, cache directory, search directory, just about the only directory you should you should be touching in this mode is the code directory. So here is my Drupal root. This corresponds to the git root as well. Uh, Pantheon expects that your Drupal root is your doc root. Uh, that's that's something we get asked about a lot. Making that configurable is is some, definitely something that we're thinking about. So uh, I can. I can dive into the theme directory and take a look at the CSS file that controls this, this background color. And uh, although this, this branch is named mint, and mint cream is the current background color, does anyone else want to see it change to something else? Thistle, Old Lace, Ghost White. These are all valid colors that I just found out about. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't know about these in nine years of web development. All right, I'm gonna go with Blanched Almond unless anyone else has a suggestion. All right, so Transmit is uploading back over to Pantheon, and, and then I'll be able to, to refresh this environment in the browser and see uh, Blanche Almond instead of uh, Mint Cream. And I've got two big tabs open, so I'm going to close a couple. Yes. This is this is Blanche Palmer. Oh, so that's what happened. Yeah. No, no. What I meant by that was okay. It took a while for the background image to pop up. Uh, I think. I don't know. I, I think we yes. The oh, this bicycle background. Yeah. Image. Yeah. And that that that's when I looked at it. Huh? Uh, so I, I can, can bring back and present. Could that be because of the connection? Possibly. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you have a faster connection. That image is one of the last things to load. Because without that, it should appear. It did, didn't it? Yeah. Looks weird without the image. All right, so there's there's that mint cream color. So uh, in in SFTP mode, uh, you can do git commits. Uh, and it, it's it's up to you if if you then want to do your, your merging on GitHub. I, I still like pull requests. Pantheon uh, has an interface where you can merge your branches within the Pantheon dashboard if you want. If you want to merge them locally, you can. If you want to do your merging on GitHub, you can. Uh, you've, got, you've got options there. So in Pantheon, how do you do that, though? How would you merge like your CSS Mint to Dev? Oh, OK, here we are. Yeah. Thank you for answering that before I finish <laughs> asking the question. All right, let's. <laughs> Let's try it. I, this is still new to me. In general, I, I prefer to 
<laughs> as I tweeted at Matt today, <laughs> I still make pull requests, even for repositories where I'm the only developer. Which to give context that it was about a documents repo. Or ah. <laughs> All right, well, while, while we wait for that, um, the next thing we're going to look at is Terminus, which is the command line interface. So uh, let's see, we'll start, we'll start just with the list of commands that are available. So uh, we've got Terminus, this is too small this time. We can view, we can view some Pantheon artwork, we can authenticate into Pantheon, uh, we can get information about Pantheon itself. We can invoke Drush on remote sites, help. We can um, see the organization's information. We're basically doing anything that's possible in the dashboard is possible on the command line. Um, there, there may be one or two pieces of functionality that are present in, in one but not the other. And, uh, and the command used most often, I think, is the terminus site command. So these are all operations that are specific to one site on Pantheon. And uh, there's there's a thread going on right now about breaking all these into their own command because this is a lot to all, all live under the, the site command. So uh, let's, let's take a look at at some particular ones. So we can, for instance, um, get the URL to a database backup. So what we've got here is terminus site backups get, uh, specifying the site in question, Hirsch Drupal 7 patch tester, the environment that we're grabbing from the dev environment. Uh, we're asking for the, the latest and the element that we're getting is the DB. We also get the files, you can get the code, um, you can bring up a menu of old backups if you wanted to get them, but here we're getting just the latest. And this is particularly helpful for any continuous integration scripts. For instance, um, before I worked at Pantheon, I was just working on a, on a personal project and I wanted one script to set up my local vagrant environment. So I did things like authenticate the terminus, use this command to get the URL to the latest database, download the database, get the files, that sort of thing. Um, other, other terminus things. Um, if we wanted to see just what, what has been happening recently on, on a site, well this is blown up a little too much. So here, here is simply a list of things, workflow operations that have happened on a site. Um, we've, we've changed the owner of the site. Uh, we've uh, added a user to the, the team. Basically just an, an audit of, of what's been happening on this site. Um, and I've got upstreams on my list, but Terminus might be a good place to jump over to Drupal 8 because last month we were looking at configuration management. So, anyone mind if I jump ahead to Drupal 8? All right, Drupal 8. Oh, and did, did the merge work? Do we have Mint Cream on the dev site? All right, we do. Good, I was worried. All right, so Drupal 8, as of yesterday, is available on Pantheon. Uh, release 1 came out last week, and uh, if you're setting up a Pantheon site, you can select Release Candidate 1 for Drupal 8 as, uh, as an upstream for, for your new site. So uh, let's, let's first just take a look and see if, yes, indeed, we have a Drupal 8 site.
great. It is it is Drupal 8. We get a wonderful toolbar. And one of the things we're looking at last month is moving around configuration files. So if in Drupal 8 you are doing something like uh, changing the the name of a content type. This is, this is something that I was testing earlier today because uh, we're, we're about to see a, a minor bug um, in, in this workflow, but the workflow itself still works. So all I've done just now is, is change uh, the name of the content type from articles to article, and while Drupal itself has its, its own browser-based user interface for importing and exporting um, configuration changes. So for instance, if we wanted to see uh, just that bit of configuration that we changed just now, it would be um, content type. Content type, that's it. So here it is in, in YAML form. And we're, we're about to see it uh, somewhat through the command line. So what I want to do is get this configuration change from the database into code. And in, in Drupal 8, there's, that's not Drupal 8, that's Expedia. In Drupal 8, all of your configuration files can live as YAML files in this directory site's default config. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to put export your configuration here, but for, for most um, sites where you are trying to move configuration from, or really for any site where you're trying to move configuration from dev to test to live, you should be exporting these, committing them to Git. So that um, the file we were just looking at, node type article, uh, well, I guess I've been changing it back and forth locally. Um, but over on, over on Pantheon, what we can do now is export this change uh, using Terminus. So right now on my dev site, I can see that I've got two files that are changed that aren't committed. So let's let's see what that is. So I've been I've been changing article um, back and forth, and I've been doing the same thing with blog posts. Kind of the see. Um, so I think I think what will happen if I export the configuration is it will go back to being article instead of articles, and we will not see a bit here. So this, uh, what this command is doing is it's running a drush command on the site, push v8 test. The environment is the dev environment, and the drush command is uh, <coughs> config export. So uh, it's telling me that node.type.articles has been changed. And it's asking me if I if I want to delete my config files and replace them with, with new ones. So yes, I do. And So moving these configuration files around through Drush uh, works, uh, but it's, it's not all that exciting. Uh, we're, we're working on getting one of those checkboxes 
and the dashboard, that'll make this just a little bit easier. So we saw those check boxes for moving database um, or uh, files up and down to the environments. We'll be adding a check box so that you can move these configuration files the same way between environments. And it's not quite what I expected. Um, so two changes. Yeah, we're, we are having connection troubles. Uh, so, uh, the, this kind of reminds me of a feature diff <laughs> in Drupal 7, where although I didn't make any changes, I don't think I made any changes to the menu system just now, um, Drupal is telling me that I did. So, that's fun. Uh, uh, I don't think that's a, a Pantheon specific thing. Uh, that's, that's what we're getting. So uh, I'll try changing this uh, content type name again. So uh, exporting it into that um, in the dev environment, I'm, I'm now going to commit it. Um, so article test is now showing up. Great. So I'm committing it to get through the dashboard. And now what I'm going to do is move code from the dev environment to the test environment and see if I can uh, synchronize this configuration, thereby updating the new label in the test environment. I'm going to ask, obviously you have to have it in the SMTP mode and not Git, because Git you have to do both, right? Right. right. So that, that needs to be thought about a little bit more because um, I'm not crazy about being in SFTP mode, but if the, if the thing you're doing is actual development on your dev environment, I don't think it, I don't think it's all that bad to then be in yeah. SFTP mode because yes, the changes you're making are going straight into the database, but you've got to get them in code eventually, so. I just think for anybody that might not know, like if it's in Git mode, like you can't do that. Right, right. Okay, so here on the test environment, our content type is still simply called article. Uh, I'm deploying code from dev to test. And, and once that's done, We'll see the change in both this um, this configuration screen, and we could then synchronize the configuration um, through the UI, the browser, or um, or through Brush. Okay, so I'll, I'll just do it through the the browser UI. So what we've got here is article and blog post. I think we're going to get a Z map on blog posts and article test. All right. I think it worked. Hooray! Yay! Yay. <laughs> Man, really got to yeah. get that checkbox. That was a lot of steps. Mm -hmm. Really got to get that. I know, right? <laughs> that was too many steps. Too many steps. So I look forward to, to that checkbox. I am, uh, yeah, Matt Cheney is doing, uh, I think, both a bad camp session and a webinar in like two weeks. So I hope that serves as motivation to get the, the checkbox in place. So it's, it's been almost an hour here. Um, this, this might be a good place for, for me to stop the, the normal demo. Uh, anyone have, have questions either about stuff that we've seen or, or anything else? Let's talk about pricing. Pricing? Sure. Well, it's pricing and scaling. Sure. Um, 
I wasn't paid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, sure. So the the price points um, twenty five dollars a month for a personal plan, one hundred dollars a month for a professional plan, four hundred dollars a month at the business plan level. What's the difference? The the main difference is that at the professional level you get solar and Redis. Uh, I think multi dev as well at the professional level. Uh, if you are registering as an agency. Um, you can get multi dev on, on all of your sites regardless of the, the pricing point. <coughs> um, at the at the business level, you get um, additional containers, um, an additional app server, and and then for really large um, for really large sites, it's uh, it ends up being a, a custom quote for. So for so how about let's talk about scaling. So we're talking about personal user. Are there any oh, there's a five gigabyte storage? How about CPUs? So you, you can you can add new app servers to any account. Mm -hmm. I found this out the hard way the other day because one accidentally got added to my personal account. <laughs> yeah. But like if you if you need more power you can just add more app servers to any of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there's a, a detailed breakdown of comparison. And yeah, it's, it's not a very granular pricing structure, but we find that it, it does match pretty well to the, the conceptual breaks in the Drupal community. There are plenty of sites that, that exist at that personal plan level where there's, there's not a high volume of traffic, they just need a reliable live website and, and that, that plan works just fine. Um, We've also had people asking uh, why aren't solar or, or Redis available as at the personal plan, and, and that's because those are technologies that are, are really useful if you are a conceptually different kind of website than the personal plan website. If you really do need Redis, it's because there's there's something very high functioning happening. Either you've got a lot of authenticated traffic, or I don't know what else. Um, some, something that's, that needs to run really fast and the anonymous caching that you simply get with Varnish at all levels is insufficient. So if, if you have a conceptually more complex website then I think that the professional plan or above um, fits. And if it's a business plan, if your business is the website, uh, then, then the business level probably fits pretty well. Regarding uh, SSL, mm -hmm. uh, the company I used to work for was a, a Pantheon partner, and we really enjoyed selling it because um, mm -hmm. we really enjoyed working inside Pantheon. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the problem that we came across with, uh, basically my question is, so you have the personal plan for $25 a month, yeah. and you can't get SSL until mm -hmm. you bump up to $100 a month uh, right. as far as like the hosting plan. Do you know if there's they're eventually going to look at offering HTTPS at least like a middle ground between the two. Mm -hmm. It's obviously like a $75 right. jump. It's a big jump, yeah. Well, yeah. it costs the 30 bucks a month to have the SSL. Right. So, yes. so what I use on, on my own personal project it <coughs> is Cloudflare, which is free. Uh, um, I set that up about a year ago, and, and that works. Um, so I think rather than like altering our pricing structure, what, um, I, and I really am just guessing here, I think the path we'll pursue is making that Cloudflare setup a little bit easier. Like I did it a year ago once Cloudflare announced, like, free SSL. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I really couldn't believe it. But it worked. It took some trial and error. I accidentally created a redirect loop. There was no documentation on it. Uh, but now there is, uh, there is documentation on how to do that. Cloudflare setup, and, and you can do that at any price level. It took you ten minutes. So I have a community account. From yeah. Like ten minutes to set up Cloudflare. Yeah. Is is the the Cloudflare free thing? Is it actually like SSL or is it like TLS? So like SSL as in like SSL version one and two, you can use it with Windows 
IE8 <coughs> or like TLS, which is doesn't require having a separate IP. And I'm not I'm not exactly certain. I know I had to move. Uh, I had to move some of the DNS to Cloudflare itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think as far as far as Pantheon is concerned, like the traffic between Cloudflare and Pantheon is not encrypted. So it's not like total end to end encryption. I I just mean like. Well, I don't know. I'll look it up later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, it makes sense for TLS to be free because it costs nothing to provide it. But SSL, yeah. you have to get an IP, and we're running out of those. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Because yeah. you can use that for CNAME. Or the workaround for like platform is to use Cloudflare because you need it direct to direct a CNAME. Mm -hmm. It's like Cloudflare is their like workaround because they don't have direct IPs like or Pantheon is like, this is your IP, and you can easily do that, like the hacking way the platform is called for. And you can use them, you can go to C name, because you can't mess with something that would be nice. So you're using their Yeah. Hey, you guys want to support Drupal console for D8? Uh, what, what about Drupal console do you want to talk about? So, I mean, Obviously, Pantheon is invested in Rush, but mm -hmm. eventually one's going to take over. Mm -hmm. And I know I've been I've gone behind console completely now, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you know you support Rush locally and console just supported remote aliases. Mm -hmm. um, is if you're supporting Drupal eight, will you support remote console integration? I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I know Greg Anderson, one of the Drush maintainers, works at Pantheon, and. I think there has been active tension <laughs> among those communities. Yeah. And I, I think Greg's attitude is they're going to coexist. There's Not an awesome going PR right anytime soon. There's an awesome PR to make them coexist even better. Okay. Just so like with console, because it's Symphony, you can write a class mm -hmm. and then Drupal Console just be like, bam, I got it because it's Symphony. Yeah. Like it's Symphony Console. Where Drush commands are like, I love Drush, mm -hmm. but writing a Drush command, my oh, God, it's yeah. just that. Where now it's like Google Console's like write a class that's picked up instantly. Yeah, to be able to have that because that makes you know, Drupal is an application. You need to do more stuff on the CLI, and if there's a way to easily integrate that, now that's where somewhere. Mm -hmm. Curious. Yeah, I, uh, I would expect that we'll we'll have something at, at some point. But what I Use most, what I've used Drupal Console for most so far mm -hmm. is the scaffolding. Yeah. Like, I, I personally was hoping that, that they would find a divide of like, one is for working with this site and one is for writing code in general, but yeah. it, it overlaps a whole lot more than that. Um, yeah, almost all my console experiences, the, the scaffolding. The scaffolding. Yeah. It started out like Yeoman for Drupal yeah. and then yeah. it came. Why not everything? Yeah. Yeah. I had a question about backups. Yeah. So now that Node Scroll is part of Pantheon, mm -hmm. uh, is there really any advantage to using backup and migrated Node Scroll with a Pantheon site, or is like just using the Pantheon's like daily backup stuff good enough? The the Pantheon daily backup stuff is good enough. It yells at you if you have backup and migrate. Oh really? So it should, yes. like, you shouldn't have this installed. Right. We have. You're too good for this. You're a Pantheon well, user. I, I think the problem is the is the assumptions backup and migrate makes about the file system. And the restore. The fact that somebody can restore back into it. That that too. <laughs> the fact that it depending on how you configure it, you might you might configure it to just like put MySQL dumps in a way web accessible location. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't. But with backup and migrate, it's pretty easy to do that. Which I know, I know, I did that without realizing how bad of an idea that was. And you know, on sites where like if someone in the world got the database, it doesn't really matter. But there are plenty of sites where you don't want anyone mm -hmm. in the world to be able to grab your database. So, are there? Are you aware of any plans to try and bring those products together more? Or yes, uh, there. The. The first direction we want to move is simplifying the migration of people who are using Backup and Migrate, making it easier for 
sites not on Pantheon, but using that tool to get into Pantheon. After that, uh, I'm not sure what will happen next. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what's actively getting worked on. Thank you. Are there any D8 upstream like profiles on there yet? There's just RC1. RC1. But I don't know, is Napoli D8 uh, stable enough to... No, not to actually use. <laughs> <laughs> no one's demo framework today. I've actually installed it yet to use, but I mean it has panels, but there's nothing really you can do. Does it actually have panels in the yeah. framework? I don't know if they've been doing. I've been playing around with some D8 to get bootstrapped up, but mm -hmm. the demo framework has 8.x. Mm -hmm. and you can install it, it has right. everything there, but like obviously panel is still a long way to go. It does. Alright, well thanks everybody. Thank